All right, the meeting. All right, we are uh, live. Welcome back, everyone, to Emerging Rev Wars, uh, Rev War Revelry. We are honored tonight to have historian, editor, conservationist, uh, Andrew Waters here. Uh, he, a uh, proud graduate of the University of North Carolina, um, doing a PhD in Clemson, so he crossed, uh, crossed the border there. Um, he is the editor of the Battle of Cowpens, Contemporary Primary Accounts, and two great books, one just recently out, the, to the end of the end of the world, and one previously, the Quaker and the Gamecock, talking about two uh, general officers there in the Carolina campaign. So thank you, Andrew, for uh, joining us tonight. Um, but what we uh, drove you into this program for was this race to the Dan, which uh, is probably one of the most successful retreats in American history. Right. Uh, for the viewers who um, who don't know what we've done, we can talk to the fifty thousand foot view um, after you make an introduction. I think I covered your biography a little bit, but if there's anything you want to add, uh, feel free and then jump into the to the race. Sure. Um, so I've, I've tried to answer this question a couple of different ways, and I feel like I've always gotten it wrong. So I'm going to try a new way tonight. Um, but I think um, kind of the, the classical definition of the race to the Dan is Nathaniel Green's retreat from Guilford Courthouse um, up across the Dan River in February of 1781. Um, so I think most historical sources treat that four day period as kind of the classic race to the Dan. Um, what I did with my book was I tried, I, I've expanded that vision of the race to the Dan and um, included kind of as the beginning of the story, the Battle of Cowpens, which occurred on January um, 17th, I believe. I'm not great with dates, uh, 1781. And kind of follow the story from Cowpens up to the Dan River, that kind of escape across the Dan River um, that Green made with, Cornwall with Cornwallis in close pursuit. Um, so my book, uh, To the End of the World, treats the race to the Dan as that period between Cowpens and when Green crosses the Dan, um, which is about a month period from seven, January 1781 to February 1781, with a look with some background uh, in the beginning to kind of set the stage for what happens. And so this the race to the, how did you come across the story? So I read that in your introduction, how it was interesting how you came upon it um, because of your day job, correct? Yeah, yeah. So um, to, to be honest, the first time I came upon it was reading uh, John Buchanan's The Road to Guilford Courthouse. So that was kind of my first introduction to the story. Um, but for, for me, the appeal of the story is because for me, it's a very, it, it's, it very much relates to my experience uh, as a North Carolinian because I lived in Salisbury for a number of years um, where a lot of the events occurred. Um, and I've been involved. I, I just, you know, I understand the geography of North Carolina is kind of um, embedded in me somehow. So that's, you know, when I first read that in Buchanan, the geography of it always appealed to me. But the more I thought about kind of doing this book, the more I was kind of thinking about the way that Nathaniel Green approached the campaign from the point of learning about the river system in the region. And I realized there was a relationship there between the ways that a conservationist would study a river system kind of strategically. Now, Green was studying the river system logistically. It wasn't exactly the same, but it was, it was, it was a process of kind of learning the terrain that I, I felt a connection with. Um, and in this story, um, there's basically four river basins that encompass this campaign. And in my career, I've worked in three of them. Up here in Spartanburg, I work on the Broad River Basin, 
in uh, one of my conservation jobs in Charlotte, I covered the Catawba River Basin, and in one I covered the Yadkin River Basin in Salisbury. So the only one I never really worked in was the, the Dan River Basin, but I just, that was part of the connection to the story I felt because I I felt that connection through the river systems of the of the story. Very good. So it uh, gives you a unique perspective. And then as you started developing the story, um, the things, how did you, why did you expand it to this much? I mean, if it's just four days, uh, was it the fit pages in a book or was there something you felt needed to be kind of more explained? Yeah, well, a couple of things. I mean, certainly to, to tell the story of, you know, just the race to the Dan. Um, I had to set the stage, which kind of with kind of the broader story of what was going on in the Carolinas at that point in time. Um, and you know, this was right at the period right after Nathaniel Green had come to the South and taken command of the, what they called the Southern Department, the the Southern branch of the Continental Army which in, in some ways was much more of a volunteer army than um, the, the Northern Department because they, they very much relied on militia. Uh, they, they counted on the militia in a much more um, regular way in the Southern Department. Um, and so Green has just come, and I've, I think it's interesting because he's just got his first independent command. He's basically been the most talented second in command for the, the first part of the war. And so he gets this command to come down to the Carolinas, and his opponent is Cornwallis, who, who has also been the most talented second in command for most of the war. And so now they're kind of squaring off in um, north, the part of the Carolinas between Charlotte and Camden, North Carolina, uh, South Carolina, between Charlotte and Camden, South Carolina. Um, so I really felt like in order to understand the context of the retreat, the, the race to the Dan, you needed to know that in, that context of what was going on at the beginning of the campaign um, and also I felt like the Battle of Calpens really was, like, was a transformational moment in all of this. I mean, that's really what set the, all of these events into action. Um, so I wanted to include that, but that also kind of broadened the story into the areas that I knew because all of that happened on the Broad River. And then they started retreating to the Catawba and the Yadkin. So it kind of linked up that way um in my mind and so but some of the nathaniel green's important work happened before he even got to command correct as he's coming south he's not just riding post pace through southern virginia and the carolinas which i thought was an interesting part that you uh, made in in the book race to the dan um can you talk a little bit about some of the, i guess that pre-command work that nathaniel green did yeah so <clears throat> that's kind of the introduction to the story, basically how I opened the book um, with this story of Nathaniel Green, kind of, he's just gotten this command, he's just gotten out of being the quartermaster general, which is a job that he never really liked, he was anxious to get out of that, he's just gotten his first command, um, so he's riding south to, to take over of the southern department, and he, he's thinking about logistics. He's thinking about ways to move supplies and people uh, up and down the Carolinas. And he and Washington actually had 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 discussions about this kind of hypothetically before um, that you could use the rivers as part of the transportation system because the roads were not were much the roads in the Northeast were, were much better. The road system was much better than the road system in the Southeast. Um, and you really, that, that had always been an issue uh, throughout the war. So it was something they'd been thinking about. So as Nathaniel Green was riding South, um, he kind of, he, he initiated a series of surveys of these river systems, trying to figure out how he could move 
um, people and supplies up and down the rivers. And they, these surveys included, you know, how the rivers would, were they fordable after a rain or how, how many days after a rain were they still fordable? How many boats were um, collected at certain points of the river? Um, how many days travel from one river to another river? So he was collecting all of this information um, to, because he thought, you know, he kind of thought he was settling in for a long campaign in North Carolina. Um, but, but as it turned out, all of this information really helped him in this strategic retreat that got initiated after the Battle of Calpins. Again and again, it, you, you see that what he had done in December 1780 as he was coming down, that intelligence really paid off for him as he was trying to move his men back across the Carolinas in this retreat. And so uh, this might be the, the dumbest question of the night, but why does he do it? Uh, where does he learn this from? Is it the conversations from Washington? Is it something in his background as quartermaster general to learn about that part, but I mean, it seems like this is something Gates could have done or Byron de Cobb. Uh, what set Green apart? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I'll have to speculate a little bit on that one. Um, I mean, I think it was just a combination of things, a constitution of knowledge. Um, he, he had been quartermaster general. So he was thinking about those things, those things, you know, how to move things was in his intellectual headspace. Um, I think his, um, he had that very kind of administrative kind of logistic uh, side to him, I think probably from his, from working in his father's businesses, um, you know, he learned how to kind of be a business manager kind of person from his experience growing up. Um, and I also just think he had a, I, I do think he probably had a brilliant mind. I think he had an extraordinary mind that was capable of thinking about different issues, different parts of human psychology and um, uh, science and strategy and all those things kind of at a, at a, at a pretty high level. So he just kind of was naturally able to, to think about those things. So that all adds, so he arrives in, in the Southern theater uh, and takes over command. Now the first thing is basically to save the army. Uh, he realizes that they're bare of supply. So he take us through his first days of green arriving and coming up with this strategy. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. You said it was happy hour. Yeah, Phil, exactly. but, uh, yeah. I poured myself a beer before I started. Um, <clears throat> so just to set the stage for this a little bit. Um, he, he was relieving the command of Horatio Gates. And, you know, as I'm sure a lot of your watchers know, Gates had been Washington's great rival. And um, Green was Washington's protege. Um, people would remark on kind of the, the, the strong bond between Green and Washington and be jealous about it because they, they seem so close throughout the war. And Gates had really screwed up at Camden. He had really um, not acted professionally, let's say. Um, and, but he had kind of regrouped and he, now he was in Charlotte and kind of, kind, of, kind of recollected and reorganized things. But there were factions in the Continental Army, right? Um, so, you know, there were people who were down there in Charlotte who were part of the Washington faction and people who were down there in Charlotte who were not part of the Washington faction. 
Um, and so when Green arrived to take command from Gates in the beginning of December 1780, um, it was it was a moment of great interest, you know, shall we say. Uh, the troops were very curious to see how the interaction between these two men would go. And to Green's credit, apparently, by all accounts, he acted very honorably. He um, was very gracious to Gates and um, they, they were, there was nothing going on. And in fact, the, the court, Gates court martial, the, the investigation into what he had done never happened. Basically, Green decided not to do that. Um, so, um, but now Gates is gone and Green's inherited this wreck. I mean, they were, the army got killed at Camden. It was a terrible disaster. And they've, they've, they've marched back. They've gone to um, Hillsboro. And now they've, they've started to move back towards Camden. Um, so they're camped in Charlotte, um, but they're really, they're, they have no, no systems, you know, there's, the men are hungry, they've got no supplies. Um, Green is just consumed all of a sudden with kind of getting this army back into shape. But I think Green realizes that there's certain elements um, that don't need to be there. And he's got Daniel Morgan um as his kind of chief senior officer and he's got a lot of talented um, soldiers the from maryland and delaware um there in camp with them and he decides to send those guys to the the south uh, to the west um and this is this is a one of the moments when green really um bucks the military conventions of the time because the conventions of the time says you never split your army um, in front of a superior force and the force that green was facing in south carolina was superior to his in pretty much every way um, but green ignored that convention by sending morgan to the west and Morgan was really kind of on a, he was trying to, to do a couple of things. He was trying to feed the guys that he had with him. Um, and he was trying to kind of stir up the militias in the Western part of the Carolinas there in, um, you know, the Spartanburg area where I am right now, um, kind of to threaten 96, uh, the, the, the British outpost at 96. So Morgan's over there kind of threatening Cornwallis's Western flank. Um, and Green, meanwhile, he moves his armies to the, to the east over to Chira, which is on the PD River. So Green has essentially opened the door to North Carolina, which is where Cornwallis is heading. He's wanting to campaign in North Carolina in the fall and in winter and um, take control of North Carolina so he can go into Virginia, hopefully the next spring. Um, but he's, he's put, essentially he's put his two forces on each side of Cornwallis's flank. And um, there's, uh, there's an action that occurs at Hammond store um, which is under the command of William Washington, who was a Virginia cavalry officer detached to Morgan. And, and this happened um, in this, uh, early December, 1780, I think. Anyway, I'm getting a little fuzzy on my dates there, but Hammond Store convinced Cornwallis that Morgan was going to try to uh, attack 96. So in December of 1780, that's why he dispatches Bannister Tarleton to push Morgan from his Western flank. And that is what the action that basically unlocked 
the race to the dam. When Tarleton pursues Morgan and Morgan defeats Tarleton at Cowpens. And so Morgan wins, but he quickly uh, heads back into North Carolina. Um, and so this also participates the, some of the, the unsung heroes, I guess, of uh, the initial move. Um, I, you brought them up in your book, but uh, William Richardson Davy, um, uh, Davidson, I forget his first name right now. But yeah. some of these guys uh, play a role. Um, so what happens, I guess, from that movement? Because it's February 9th, I think, when they actually, Green and um, Morgan's men actually finally meet up. Um, so there is a almost a month gap as they're trying to, to form a juncture. So uh, I guess we can start with some of, the, some of these other players that pop up in your book here. Yeah, certainly. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so one of the things that is important um, that happens after Cowpens is Morgan moves to the north. And this really confuses Cornwallis. Um, he can't figure out what Morgan's doing. And Cornwallis essentially gets lost for a couple of days, allowing Morgan to escape to the back to the east. Now, Cornwallis has, has basically gotten his forces back together and he's chasing Morgan and he wants to crush Morgan. I mean, he would be delighted if he could catch Morgan and crush Morgan, but really he wants his prisoners, the, the British prisoners back because Morgan takes, I believe it's about 800 prisoners at Cowpens and Cornwallis really wants to retrieve these prisoners. So that's why he's so hard in pursuit of Morgan. Um, but Morgan um, is able to um, deceive him and, and still move east and get back a, the Catawba River. And I think that's one of the um, things in the story that, that I got kind of got interested in um, as I was writing it was this period um, where Cornwallis is, is finally campaigning. He's finally started this campaign into North Carolina and things aren't, things are a little bit crazy. It's kind of chaotic. It's kind of out of control. Um, and he's trying to figure out how to, um, how to operate in this theater, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's essentially the American frontier. Um, and he, you know, he, he makes, he, he does some things well, but he makes lots of mistakes. Um, and he gets to this place um, called Ramser's Mill, which is west of the Catawba River. And um, Morgan is already across the Catawba at this point. And Cornwallis kind of stops at Ramser's to regroup. And he knows he has to, he, he's got to do something dramatic. He's, he's got to kind of regain control of this situation and um, do something that displays his, his determination and his, um, you know, I guess uh, I've been reading about this, the Stoics um, lately. So, you know, he, he wants to display his kind of his Stoic ethos, if you will. Um, and um, so he, he orders, a, this a, a giant bonfire and one of the issues that he's been having is they can't move as fast as the, Amer the Americans are much more mobile than they are because the British army traveled heavy they traveled with all their um, you know with wagons um, with camp followers um, you, you know all of their accoutrement all their baggage the officers all had substantial baggage. They traveled with their supplies. So that was part of what was slowing him down. So he had this very dramatic bonfire and he burned all his um, supplies and wagons at Ramser's Mill and kind of set the stage for this relentless pursuit across the Carolinas. Now, I know I've gotten off track with your question, Philip. Okay. Uh, so that gets us to the Catawba River and um, 
that's where we meet William Davidson, who is the, the militia commander of the Rowan militia, which Rowan was all of that part of North Carolina at the time. And Davidson had been a Continental officer and um, previously in the war and was kind of back in the Carolinas and now had been made a, a general of militia. And he meets Green. Uh, well, he and so meanwhile, just to get catch us back up, Green has has kind of ridden across the Carolinas with a very small guard to join Morgan, while the rest of the hit, you know, his division that he had with him at the Chiraz are moving north up towards Guilford Courthouse, where they're kind of planning a junction. Um, so Green is now at the Catawba River, and and Davidson and Green meet. Um, Ann Morgan and several other officers to discuss strategy. And um, Davidson has a kind of a famous anecdote in, that I talk about in the book. He said, even though Green had never set eyes on the Catawba River, he knew it as well as someone who had grown up there. And you know, Green had just digested all this information from this, this survey report that he'd received about a month earlier, and he, he just had a very um, strategic understanding of how the river functioned. And so at, at the Catawba, at a place called Cowan's Ford, um, Green just kind of naturally figured out that this was where Cornwallis would, would try to take the river. So that's where he set up his defenses. But he had, he, the Continental Army was at this point, they were still retreating. They were relying on the militia for the defenses at Cowan's Ford. The militia was charged with um, delaying the British crossing and um, giving the Continentals time to retreat back towards Salisbury and then across the Yadkin. So sure enough, Cowan's Ford is exactly where Cornwallis chooses to, um, to, to cross the Catawba and force. Um, he does have a diversionary force kind of further north, but they, they cross the Catawba River at Cowan's Ford. Davidson's militia is set up there and they have, um, it is a battle. It's the Battle of Cowan's Ford. It's a minor battle. Um, but it was a pretty significant action in the Southern campaign. And the reason we don't really know too much about Cowan's Ford now is because it's submerged uh, under Lake Norman, which um, they put in, I don't know, back of the 30s or 40s. Yeah, I stopped actually, I stopped and saw there's what, one historical sign, I think, marker that says somewhere in this general area uh, with the Battle of Cowan's Ford. Um, but before we, uh, since we're talking about a four, we had a great question that came in and says, okay. both armies managed to move everyone across the river. Did it take days? Were lots of boats available? Or I guess the, part of this is already answered is a ford. So that means obviously you can walk across it, correct? So at the Catawba, um, Morgan had been able to march his army across the Catawba River, um, but it had rained right after that. And so after these heavy winter rains, the Catawba was no longer fordable on the march. And that's one of the reasons Cornwallis got delayed at Ramsour's Mill was because the Catawba wasn't fordable. Um, and then at the, at the Yadkin, at, at the trading ford is what they called it. This was the main crossing of the, the wagon road, the great wagon road that moved all the way south from Philadelphia into the Carolinas and into Georgia. So this was a very well-known, very heavily trafficked area of the Carolinas, the, the, the trading ford at the Yadkin River. Um, and the Continental Army had been set up there for quite some time. They were using the trading ford to move back and forth. Um, but again, at the, once they got to the Yadkin, the Continentals had all their boats already there and they were able to use the boats and get across safely. Again, it was an issue of the rain making the river 
unfordable. So you had to use boats. So because the, the Continentals had collected the boats there, they were able to get across. The British had, when the British got to the riverbank, all of the boats were on the other side of the river. So they had to wait, they had to march north and they crossed at a place called Shallow Ford, maybe two or three days later, um, a couple, couple days later. Um, so it was just different for different instances. A very similar thing happened at the Dan, at kind of the, the concluding part of the story. Cornwallis had received information that uh, Green had to cross at the upper fords, the marchable fords. Um, but that was bad intelligence. And I think that's one of the stories of the book is Cornwallis um, didn't have good intelligence. His, he didn't have good um, information about what was going on in advance. And it turned out that Green could cross at the lower fords because he had already collected all the boats. And that was part of the work that was being done by Edward Carrington, who was someone you mentioned earlier in the interview, who was another one of Green's officers who had kind of put some of this infrastructure in place and collected the boats at the Dan River that enabled Green to escape. Um, the, the escape at the Dan wasn't, you know, the British weren't kind of pulling up to the shore as the Americans got across, but it was pretty close. It was just a couple of hours um, after the Americans got across that the British got there. Uh, and uh, thought about the, the troops. So, I mean, that's perilous for Green to literally ride across the state to meet there at uh, Cowan's Ford, I mean, with a small escort. Um, the men that he leaves behind, so you're looking at what is the numbers, if you do know, this was a question, is uh, how many men are with Green's column, I think it's kind of what UJ, that continues to march up, and how many men, uh, respectively, are with Morgan? Is it about a 50-50 split? Um, well, let me, uh, let me, uh, give the caveat that I'm really not great with no numbers. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but it's roughly, I think Morgan, Morgan still had pretty much the entirety of the flying army, about 700, 750 men. So that was the group, the flying army that was retreating across the Catawba and the Yankton. Um, the part that Green had left behind was not a lot larger. I believe it was about a thousand or eleven hundred men. So it was it was more men, but it was the less well trained men um, and the the um, kind of the rougher recruits. And so the the flying camp said. Uh, so when you get to Guilford, you get across the rivers. I think David uh, Davidson. I don't want to jump ahead, but Davidson is killed. Correct? Is he the one, or is it Davy? I always get those two mixed up. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, no, it's Davidson. Davidson, the militia general, is killed at Cowan's Ford. And Davidson is kind of famous in North Carolina because he is the namesake of Davidson College, which is a wonderful um, college just north of Charlotte. Um, and that college was named, some of Davidson's ancestors name that school in Davidson's honor, basically. Um, but that's kind of why he's well known in, in uh, North Carolina because of his connection to Davidson College. Now, Davy was a very talented cavalry officer who had joined with um, the Continental Army in Charlotte, essentially. Um, but he was, he, he had been a militia cavalry officer, but basically he was detached to the Continental Army when Green got there. And, and Green recognized uh, Davy was a very talented person um, and made him his, his um, commissary officer, kind of the guy in charge of getting the, the food. Um, and, you know, this kind of relegates Davy to a diminished status um, in this part of the story. Um, basically, he is, he doesn't get much of the glory in this part of the story, but his glory had come kind of just before all this when he had fought with Sumter at Hanging Rock and 
um, been very much involved in that part of the campaign that was kind of between Charlotte and Camden in the fall of 1780. And Davy, of course, goes on to be the founder of the University of North Carolina, or, you know, kind of the, the spiritual founder of the University of North Carolina and a governor of North Carolina, a very prominent North Carolinian. Well, that, so everything has a tie back to the American Revolution there. It seems like any university in North Carolina then. Um, uh, <laughs> as they uh, head out, um, so you had mentioned this, that Cornwallis has very bad um, intelligence. Um, so is this part of North Carolina um, highly loyalist or is it just fair? So, so why does he get into support um, as he comes into Carolina? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the British were relying on what they, what's been called by historians, the Southern strategy, which was basically the, the, the assumption that once the British army got to the South, that the loyalists of the South would kind of coalesce around them and come rise up and retake um, control of the governments. <clears throat> and this had happened to some to some degree in South Carolina after they uh, the, the British took Charleston in May of 1780. Um, they were able to establish some loyalist government and some loyalist militia, although it was never kind of as robust as the British had been led to believe it would be. So the strategy to move into North Carolina relied on a lot of the same assumptions. And they were really counting on the loyalists to kind of um, rise up as the British army was moving into the into these states in force. Um, and I think what went wrong, basically, in North Carolina, a big part of what went wrong was that Cornwallis just couldn't get here in time. Um, he, he kept getting delayed. He, he got to, he probably should have moved up after Camden, but he, he waited. Then when he got to Charlotte um, that September, he ran into Davy, who we were just mentioning, and Davy um, defended Charlotte and put up a lot of resistance there. And, he, and then he had uh, to come back after Kings Mountain. So it just, just kind of never worked out for him. He kept running into to issues and problems and and, he, and by the time he finally got into North Carolina after Calpens, the, the enthusiasm for this British occupation force had just diminished. People weren't sure if it was going to work out or not, um, especially after Calpens um, and Kings Mountain. So things were in flux and, and the American cause was ascendant, I think, by the time Cornwallis finally got into North Carolina. So as he's so he's in the uh, driver's seat, Cornwallis uh, burnt his burnt his baggage, headed all uh, full blown for the American army, and then Green has to swallow that his most what trusted subordinate, Daniel Morgan, has to leave the army, and so who takes over what becomes like the flying camp uh, from there for the last last leg of the journey? And so I'm feeding you this question because being a native Marylander, there's a guy who takes over. That uh, I, I we have to mention if we're going to talk about the last track of the Dan, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, Philip, you're gonna you're gonna kill me. I can't remember. Tell me his name. I can't remember it. Otto Holland Williams. Uh, okay, Williams. Thank you so much, um, Williams. Yeah, the, I mean, I for me, of course, I wrote the book, but I think that's another great point in this story. Um, Morgan has come back, um, you know, even at Calpens, he was, his physical condition was really suffering. Um, probably he had sciatica in his, in his back, a nerve condition in his back um, and some, and other issues. And, you know, even as, as he's retreating across North Carolina, he's telling Green, listen, I can't go on with this anymore. Um, and Green keeps, you know, Morgan is clearly his, his best officer, the most talented officer that he has, especially after Calpens, which was 
you know, Morgan is, is still studied and revered today. He's like kind of this mythical figure in the uh, American Continental Army. Um, so, but, but Morgan just, he, he says, I, I can get you across the, the Yadkin, but then I've got to go. So they get to Guilford Courthouse is where they have retreated to kind of after they get across the Yadkin. Um, they're hoping for the, lo the mo local militia there to join them, but it th things are so in flux and, you know, armies moving and people, populations moving and it, it was just chaos. Um, so the militia does not come out to join Green very much at Guilford Courthouse. And Morgan's got to, he says, I gotta go, I cannot do it. Um, and so finally Green acquiesces and he, he, he honorably dismisses Morgan and Morgan goes back into Virginia. But now he needs, um, he, to, to begin his retreat, he, he wants to put essentially the flying army, his same best troops as a diversionary force between him and Cornwallis. And he wants the flying army to um, make a move due north to try to persuade Cornwallis that Green is moving towards the upper forts, which is exactly what Cornwallis thinks he's doing. So he, he commissions Otho Holland Williams, the great Maryland officer, Real. to command the flying army um, and take Morgan's place. And Williams is, um, you know, he's been in the Continental Army pretty much the whole time. He was captured at um, Fort Washington, I believe. Um, and held in captivity for a long time and then get, gets paroled, comes back to the Continental Army. Um, he, he's, he ends up with the Maryland troops that get sent south and ends up under command of Gates. Very experienced officer. Um, started in, in, the, in a rifle corps, I always think is interesting. Um, so he commands this flying army that kind of is kind of shielding Green from Cornwallis as they move towards the Dan River. And Cornwallis takes the bait. He, he follows Williams. Um, and, I, you know, I think they go for about a day before Cornwallis finally figures out what Green's up to. But that was a crucial day. And that really bought Green a lot of time to get to the... Um, the Dan and, and essentially those last four days are basically a cat and mouse game between Tarleton, Bannister Tarleton's British Legion and kind of the, the advance guard of the British Army under O'Hara and um, Williams flying army with, with Light Horse Harry Lee because Lee has now joined um, the army at this point and he's commanding the mounted troops and also uh, serving very kind of dire and valuable service during this point of the retreat. And so they arrive at the Dan. Um, and so the, the most successful retreat probably in prior, maybe outside of Washington, getting through New Jersey after the fall of New York. Right. What, um, I know you speak about this on a book, but why is this period forgotten? Is it because it's a retreat? Is it because the lack of primary sources because they're they're moving quickly so people can't write about it at the time um what uh not to give away your conclusion but uh to inspire people to, to get the ball here so yeah i think that's interesting um i think the reason people don't know about it really is because it was a retreat um you know there was no kind of significant uh battle or engagement although the battle of cowan's ford certainly um, here regionally is significant, but there was no kind of big moment um, as part of the race to dance. So that's one reason why it's not remembered. Um, 
I think you just don't get a lot of credit for for wearing somebody out. You know, you're you green had essentially kind of spoiled everything for Cornwallis. And I think Cornwallis already had a lot of suspicions that things weren't going to work out the way he told he was told they they should work out. Um, but the fact that he couldn't, he, he couldn't manage to crush green and the, uh, green got away was demoralizing. They, after that, the loyalist support that they were counting on never materialized. After that, they basically fought a stalemate with green at Guilford courthouse. And after that, Cornwallis had had enough. And I talk about in the book, um, the race to the Dan was actually kind of better known, you know, it's not surprising, but in its time, when it was being reported in the kind of the newspapers of its time, it was the, the, the accomplishment of it very much was recognized and people kind of understood that, that this, this had been a very successful strategic retreat. Um, but over time, that story has just gotten lost and we just, you know, it's too deep in the weeds of American history um, for a lot of people um, to, to know about. They just don't get exposed to it. And so uh, if you, as you're writing the book, obviously uh, anyone who's written a book or done any type of research project, there's something that comes out and not surprises or, or enlightens you or something. Was there any antidote or account that you didn't know about previously that you uncovered while doing uh, the writing for this book? Um, yeah, you, I meant to prepare something for that question. Oh, my, my dog is. Somebody. He has the answer at least. No. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, one thing that I kind of, I, I, as, as I was writing the book, I got very interested in this idea of the partisan soldier. Um, kind of the, the officer, the, the talented officer who could operate on his own. And this, this idea was very much um, kind of an, an, an enlightenment idea of its time. There, you know, people read texts about military theory um, during this time in history, and, and, and Green had read about this idea of the partisan officer and um, other American officers would would be reading these texts. And I just got really interested in in that kind of aspect of it, that theme of um, the American officer being in a partisan officer, you know, not by design, but by by necessity, by happenstance. There was just a lot more um, creativity allowed in the Continental Army just because of the circumstances of the way the army was formed. Um, and that's one thing that I really got interested in as I was writing the book and that I ended up trying to weave some of that into the, the story of what was going on. And that uh, leads to the point that we've had a, a thing, prior conversation over email about the genesis of Nathaniel Green's leadership. And that's also yeah. part of the uh, topic of your other book, uh, which you mentioned briefly, The Quaker and the General. Uh, or quicker in the Gamecocks, excuse me. Um, so was, uh, is that the reason you wanted to do the uh, race to Dan as well? Because the fascination with Nathaniel Green? Yeah, I'm, I am, I'm a, I'm a, I try not to admit it, but I am a fan of Nathaniel Green. Uh, I, I think he's interesting. I mean, he was somebody that, Again, I didn't even really know about until I read Buchanan's Road to Guilford Courthouse. And, um, you know, I just thought he was such an interesting character. And um, his story is so interesting to me. And, and, and it, he had come to this part of the American Revolution that the, that book also opened my eyes to. I really didn't know about before then. So I just got interested in Nathaniel Green. Um, I had just moved to South Carolina, you know, right around this time. And um, the first book, The Quaker and the Gamecock, was really trying to tell that story, the story of 
Nathaniel Green coming to South Carolina. Um, and then after I'd written that book, I, I knew I wanted to write the Race to the Dam book because it, I was just so interested in it. Um, really because I had, I had lived and worked in a lot of these areas where it, it had happened. And I, it was something that I, I just felt compelled to, to document because I felt a connection to the, the story of it. Um, but, you know, obviously the, the fact that Nathaniel Green was um, kind of featured in both of those stories uh, is not ins insignificant. I mean, I, I, I wanted to tell the story, both stories partly through his experience. Oh, yeah. So it's Nathaniel Green um, in the South dealing with uh, in the, the partisan concept um, is a major part of the Green to continental officer. He is well read in, in the subject and he continues um and to give a plug um why uh the, the, the quake and the gamecock is that a um the relationship uh how does that turn into a book are they um there's someone who doesn't know who the gamecock is um, yeah when okay here. yeah just uh plug in the other book here so okay so the gamecock was a, a south carolina militia general named thomas sumter and, um, you know, growing up around here, Sumter is somebody you, you hear about. You hear about the Gamecock um, primarily because the, it's the state mascot for the University of South Carolina. Um, but also through Fort Sumter, which is in Charleston Harbor and a very historic site. Um, around here where I live, they have Sumter National Forest. So he's, he's a, a pretty significant regional figure. And he was actually um, kind of predated Francis Marion as the first great South Carolina militia general um, during this, this portion of the American Revolution, the Southern campaigns, kind of after the, when the British come and take Georgia, Savannah, Georgia, and Charleston. Um, so he very much has had a kind of a claim on being the militia general for the state of South Carolina. Now, um, Marion and Andrew Pickens were kind of coming in behind him, but at the time of when Green gets to South Carolina, Sumter is, is kind of the running the show. And Green is kind of the one who's coming in to this new environment. Um, now, of course, um, all of the South Carolina militia were, were pledged to the, the command of the, the Continental Army. And, you know, kind of technically that made Green their, their commanding officer, um, but they still had personality conflicts and kind of misunderstandings. And, you know, just any kind of issue that, that you experience in leadership or organizational development as a leader, you have to deal with these conflicts and you have to kind of, you know, you're the one kind of coming in new and, and kind of trying to assimilate into a new work environment, basically. So you, you got to kind of work it out. You got you, you got to kind of, um, you can't just put your foot down and, and assert authority. You got to um, try to try to um, build alliances with these people who you're working with. So that's basically the story of the, the Quaker and the Gamecock is this relationship between Nathaniel Green and Thomas Sumter and kind of Green coming into Sumter's turf and Sumter not really liking it too much. Um, and they kind of had to work it out. Uh, and it didn't work out too great, um, although ultimately you might argue that Sumter, it worked out better for Sumter after the war than Green, just because of circum other circumstances. Right, man. Uh, so we had this great question come in, um, and I'll end with this before we uh, segue into the last part. Is um, How early, and do you know who coined the phrase race to the dam? Is that uh, a contemporary uh, count, or that come um, what's the Put you on the final spot or the spot. Uh, I did know that at one point. I believe. Um, I guess I'm going to have to say I don't know. Um, I think you know the American Revolution was 
was very well documented um, conflict. There, that's one thing I enjoy a, or like about doing historical research on this era is there, there's, a, there's a wealth of information out there available. And I would suspect that it's, it was just a term that kind of, um, kind of historians began using as they wrote about this period. But I do not know the definitive answer to that question. All right, so uh, we have to do some research. So we, uh, always, always another question to research. But That's right. um, if someone wanted to purchase uh, these books, um, are, do you have a speaking engagement coming up or the best way to Amazon or West Home? Or, um, yeah, how did you get a copy? Yeah, um, both of my uh, publishers um, are, are well distributed. So you can easily go into your bookstore and ask them to get them. Um, which is, you know, of course, what I recommend is support your local bookstore. Um, they are both available on Amazon. Um, and you can also check them out, andrewwaters.net. I've got links to, um, I think, just the Amazon on there. But if there's some other articles and things there, some of my other writing, if, you know, if you want to check some of that out, that's at my website. Perfect. So uh, you heard it. We'll also drop it uh, in the chat as well, uh, andrewwaters.net. Uh, um, but uh, uh, Andrew, thank you for uh, joining us here uh, this on the Sunday evening. Uh, we appreciate the conversation on, on the race to the Dan um, and a little bit about the Quaker and the Gamecock uh, and the history of the Southern Theater. And so uh, with that, we'll wrap it up. Uh, in two weeks, we'll return with another Red War revelry. Uh, but in November, we're actually Heading back to New Jersey, where Nathaniel Green was at one time, uh, with the first annual Emerging Revolutionary War bus tour, November 12th through the 14th. Information on uh, the website emergingrevolutionarywar.org. Um, for, but once again, Andrew, thank you uh, for joining. Everyone, thanks for listening in and the great questions and comments. And uh, be safe, and we'll see you in about two weeks for the next revelry. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Philip.